All right, this is a lecture on physiology of pregnancy and birth. Um, I did not put this uh, together, but I'm going to be reading it because it's helpful for me uh, to do that, to learn it. And uh, hopefully it's helpful for you to hear somebody else talk through this. Hopefully I don't make any mistakes. Okay, so starting out here, uh, we have uh, fetoplacental unit. And this means basically the fetus and the placenta. So the mom and baby connections and their interactions between them. So uh, the fetoplacental unit controls the endocrinologic events in pregnancy. Uh, basically meaning that uh, the endocrine system is going to be releasing a lot of um, cell signals and that sort of thing and uh, the fetus and the placenta are going to be uh, much of what's responsible for these signals being sent out. A lot of the changes that happen in the mother and uh, as well as the baby. So it says the fetus plays the most active role in controlling um, its growth and maturation. So the fetus, under this it says the adrenal gland is the major endocrine component of the fetus. And if you remember the adrenal gland is that gland that sits on top of the kidney. It's got uh, three major layers, uh, glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. And um, they each uh, secrete certain hormones. <clears throat> I won't go into that right now. Or maybe I will if it's on here. <laughs> so it's uh, composed of the outer layer. Um, and, uh, and an inner layer. So it looks like here it's saying that the definitive zone, also known as the adult zone, it looks like it's a little different in children is what, what it looks like here. So it looks like they have uh, the definitive zone, also known as the adult zone, or the outer zone, and then it also looks like they have the inner zone, which is the fetal zone. So that's, that's different. Um, um, it says it develops into three components of the adult adrenal cortex. So these two zones develop into the three zones later on. So the fetal zone, also known as the inner zone, at term is 80% of the fetal gland. So it looks like when uh, this baby first starts out, maybe I should draw a little picture here so that it's a little bit more obvious as to what's going on. So it sounds like what they have, um, um, you know, normally our uh, adrenal gland is um, you know, is something like this, and ours has you know three layers, and then a you know medulla or whatever. Uh, but it looks like this baby one has basically uh, two, so it has this outer or definitive or adult zone, and this inner or this fetal uh, zone, and. It looks like when the baby first starts out, this outer this outer zone here is 80% of um, of the adrenal uh, gland when the when the baby's an infant. So <clears throat> it says primarily it secretes androgens. So those are going to be things like you know sex hormones. Uh, so it looks like that this zone, this this uh, inner zone, the fetal zone, which is 80% is very similar to the zona reticularis, which is the one that secretes androgens in the adult. Um, estrogen, testosterone, whatever, probably estrotriol is what I'm guessing. Uh, estrotriol is, there's three different types of estrogen. There's estrone, which is secreted from fat. Estradiol, which is secreted from um, adult women. Um, I won't go into that right now. And then there's estrotriol, which is secreted from the baby. So, um, it says it stores catecholamines that maintain fetal homeostasis. And it has other, other roles, but they're not fully understood. All right, now moving on to the placenta. It says here the placenta contains genes from, um, from father, mother. It must be mother and father. Okay, from both. <laughs> it contains genes from both mother and father. And um, <clears throat> that's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, I guess that makes sense since it's part of the baby and the baby um, contains genes from both mother and father. So um, it produces steroid and peptide hormones and the placenta lacks 
17-alpha-hydroxylase, so it cannot directly convert progesterone to estrogen. So um, there's this whole pathway, cholesterol here uh, <clears throat> is changed by uh, enzymes into progesterone, and progesterone um, can turn into estrogen. Uh, by this pathway, but it looks like this one, it does not have the 17 alpha hydroxylase. It's spelled A L P H. There we go. It looks like the, the placenta is lacking that. Um, so uh, it says so it uses androgens from uh, the fetal adrenal for estrogen production. So the, the fetus is the thing that produces. See here. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, look at here. So here's the placenta. It makes the progesterone, but um, it's the fetus that enables changing that progesterone into androgens, and then then into estradiol or estradiol. I'm guessing. Um, okay. So the mother. The uh, it says the ovarian corpus luteum produces progesterone, or 17 hydroxyprogesterone in early pregnancy. So, uh, there we go. So, inside of the ovary, uh, if we were to look at it here, um, it's got these different layers. Here's the, here's the egg. Oops. Uh, here's the egg here itself, and then around it are these, these layers, and there's the, uh, granulosa, corpus granulosa. Anyway, these, these different layers around the follicle produce different hormones, and once the egg is excreted, they stay behind and they continue to uh, produce hormones, namely progesterone. And um, what this is saying is that the, uh, the corpus luteum is what produces the, uh, uh, the progesterone. Um, via this enzyme 17 hydroxyprogesterone in early pregnancy and, and we knew that if that progesterone stops the baby comes out so produ production of progesterone then shifts to the placenta so early on the the mother is the one producing the, the progesterone but after a while as you can see over here it is the placenta that ends up making this progesterone the, and, the, and then the baby kind of takes over um, I think that's around five weeks, but I, I uh, don't quote me on that. Um, so, um, maternal hypothalamus and uh, posterior pituitary produce and release oxytocin. Um, so we know that uh, in up in the mother's uh, brain. There is a structure uh, that looks, uh, it doesn't actually look like this, but I'll, here's a representation of it. The anterior and posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is what secretes things like uh, thyroid stimulating hormone and growth hormone and all these different things like that. Um, but the, the, um, the posterior pituitary secretes uh, two things, and one of these things is something called oxytocin. And oxytocin uh, goes to the uterus and also the breasts and causes smooth muscle contraction, um, which expels the baby but also expels milk from the, the mother's breasts. And um, it was very important in that process. So uh, it says that the maternal hypothalamus and posterior pituitary uh, produce and release oxytocin. Um, the reason why it says hypothalamus is because actually the, the neuron cell bodies are up here in the hypothalamus and they have axons that come down and the axons make up the posterior pituitary and so it comes out of the posterior pituitary but the neuron bo cell bodies themselves are in the hypothalamus whereas it's different in the anterior pituitary where the cell bodies themselves are here in the anterior pituitary there are there are um, there are cells in the hypothalamus, but they release small peptide um, uh, cell signals that travel down via a blood route, not axons, and those act on these cells 
and then these cells will release their respective hormones. There's like prolactin, and there's just a bunch of hormones that, that come out of the anterior pituitary. And um, so it's a little bit different there. So um, hormones of pregnancy that you should know. So one of them here is the human chorionic gonadotropin, also sometimes called HCG. And uh, this one's important because it's what they use for pregnancy tests. Uh, around seven days, you can check the mother's serum or blood, and you can find detectable levels of HCG, which indicates pregnancy. Uh, around 14 days, you can check urine, and um, detectable levels of urine will indicate pregnancy. Um, and uh, that's what pregnancy tests uh, this urine pregnancy test use is uh, is that so it says here that the source of this HCG is from the placental syncytiotrophoblast um, so what the syncytiotrophoblast is is uh, when the when the egg so here's the over oops there's the ovaries here and they go down the fallopian tubes and it goes into the uterus like this um, so when the egg travels down here, it makes its way down and it implants here in the uterus. And uh, it has this, um, I'm just going to kind of blow up what's going on here. It has this layer of cells around it. And this layer of cells meets up with the wall of the uterus. So this is kind of what's happening here. And um, uh, they call this, these cells right here, the trophoblast. And um, the trophoblast meets up with this, and it starts, the, the cells in the trophoblast mix in with the cells of the uterus, and they, they call that a syncytia. A syncytia is where you've got, they say, a cell here and a cell here, and they both have their own nucleus, and maybe a cell here and a cell here. But then these cells merge, and as they merge, they become like one large cell. This happens in some viruses like syncytia. They still have two nuclei, though, like a uh, like, uh, respiratory syncytial virus that makes this big syncytia. And, and viruses and, or, um, yeah, viruses like to do this, or some, some um, bugs like to do this, because they're able to escape the human immune system. But this also occurs in the instance of forming the syncytiotrophoblast, which is what you know, ends up becoming the placenta. And um, this kind of creates these, these little fingers down here they call villi. They're not actually like the villi we're familiar with. But this side would be mom, and this side would be, would be fetus. And then there's this, this blood exchange that occurs over these barriers, and this would be placenta, I guess it's not necessarily fetus, but the placenta, and then this cord will come in here with its blood vessels and then go and feeding the little baby as the baby grows, the fetus grows. Uh, and that's kind of how it works. So they call this, this structure here, this, uh, you know, syncytiotrophoblast as it, as it grows, and it's this thing here uh, that is what secretes the, um, um, the HCG. So the, the function of the HCG, the, the human chorionic gonadotropin, uh, the function of this is to prevent regression of the corpus luteum and increases the T cells that affect immunity. So earlier, you know, we were talking about how um, there was what happened originally is back here in the ovary, there was a follicle that matured and the follicle had all these cells around it, okay? And... Um, and then eventually it filled full of fluid so much that this egg squirted out and it started this process here that we we're talking about. Well, these cells around it stay, okay? They, they remain here. In fact, they get, you know, larger or whatever. And they call these cells without the egg in the middle. There's no egg in the middle anymore. Uh, they call these cells the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum secretes the progesterone and important hormones that allow the baby to grow properly. And, um, and that, that is maintained from the, uh, this, um, oops, this is such a trophoblast is going to secrete, uh, the beta HCG. And that beta HCG tells this corpus luteum to stay alive and continue producing. Um, 
and this increases T cells that affect immunity. Okay, good to know. So other functions of this is it regulates immune tolerance for the fetus and the mother so the baby doesn't get attacked. So we don't want the the uh, we don't want the baby growing in there. We don't want the mother to think that this is hostile and to her immune system to attack it. So this helps this helps that not occur. Okay, so now something called human placental lactogen. And this is a really interesting one. Um, this is secreted also from the placenta, uh, but basically we understand what occurs in uh, the mother's body is that the mother has all these cells, and these cells uh, have the ability to uptake sugar, okay? And um, when sugar is uh, going throughout the bloodstream like this, your body has a way of detecting this and releases something called insulin. And insulin goes over to these cells and it opens up these little channels and it allows the sugar to travel oops, allows the sugar to travel um, into the uh, oh boy, there we go into the cells and there the sugar will, um, you know, ultimately creates, you know, fat and that sort of thing and stores it as fat or uses it as energy and um, and that helps the mother store her excess sugars. Well, the thing is though is that when you've got a, a baby growing, I'll make the baby pink over here, This these baby cells, they need some of the sugar and if the insulin is going to be um, taking all of that that uh, sugar and it's uh, all these uh, all the sugar in the bloodstream and taking it to the mother cells the baby is not going to get the sugar that it needs so the fetus says all right I'm going to make something called human placental lactogen and this human placental lactogen is going to go over here and it's going to affect these cells and it's going to make them less responsive to uh, to insulin and so rather than having all of the sugar go into these cells, we'll let some sugar go into the cells, but the rest of the sugar is going to travel through the uh, placenta and we're going to get that sugar into baby cells instead. And so um, that's, that's good. That allows the baby to get the sugar and nutrients that it needs to grow and prevents it from from going in here. Well the problem though is that um, this is, sounds an awful like a lot like type 2 diabetes basically where cells are not very responsive to insulin and so you get high levels of uh, serum glucose and um, and that does develop sometimes they call that gestational diabetes um, but most of the time that doesn't occur most of the time mom um, is able to get the sugar she needs, her blood sugar levels don't get too high and the baby gets the sugar it needs and it's this nice balance and it works out just fine. But sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So, um, uh, where was I? So, antagonizes maternal glucose use, so the more glucose goes to the fetus. Yeah, there you go. Um, other, it says increases changes of gestational diabetes, low values found in pregnancy lost. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's self-explanatory. Uh, okay, now moving on to corticotropin releasing hormone. So this is from the placenta, and uh, looks like a placenta is really secreting a lot of different things here. Um, so the placenta um, uh, releases this CRH or corticotropin releasing hormone and that stimulates fetal adrenocorticotropic hormone secretion. So the baby is going to release these uh, corticotropic hormones and uh, that is going to result in DHEAS secretion uh, which then converts to progesterone production. So earlier we were looking up here, DHEAS is a type of um, androgen or whatever, type of 
sec, uh, steroid type thing. And, uh, <laughs> good words there. Uh, maybe not strictly an androgen, but anyway, it, it, allow, it ultimately is going to allow for more of the kind of hormones that the, the baby needs, um, uh, which is going to result in progesterone. I think perhaps this cholesterol here may be DHEA. I, I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, but that's good to know. So this corticotropin-releasing hormone is going gonna, is gonna to cause more of this DHEA, um, which is going to allow for more progesterone. So this is all part of a good cycle here. All right, the other thing is progesterone, or P4. This comes from the placenta, as we talked about earlier. Prevents uterine contractions. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, the placenta is making this progesterone, and as long as the progesterone levels are high, the, the mother's body, uterus, doesn't try to push out whatever is in there. Uh, when that progesterone drops suddenly, the result is going to be uh, a menstrual cycle, essentially. Uh, it's going to expel the contents of the uterus, and um, or I guess the menses, the bleeding part. Or if it drops suddenly, it's going to, and there's baby in there, it's going to expel the baby. And uh, that's good when you're full term, and that's uh, dangerous when you're not full term. Dangerous for the baby. Um, so it prevents uterine contraction, suppresses gap junctions between the myocytes. So that drops suddenly, eventually that's going to be a good thing. You're going to want progesterone to drop. Okay, 17, hydroxyprogesterone. So this comes from the corpus luteum. This supports early pregnancy until progesterone begins. So it looks like the form of, um, yeah, this is, this is going to be what takes the, does the job until, um, until the, um, we get enough progesterone to maintain the baby from, from other sources. So early on, remember I was saying early, first five weeks or so, the corpus luteum is what's produce, producing progesterone, and uh, later on, the uh, placenta is what's producing the progesterone. Okay, estrogens. So, it says placenta and mom. We're mostly focusing on what the placenta, okay. Alright, so uh, that's where this comes from. Uh, cholesterol from mom goes to the placenta and becomes progesterone. Good to know, since such a trophoblast does this, all right. Uh, the progesterone then goes to the, um, let's have a Y there. This is really badly spelled. Okay, that's all right. So uh, cholesterol from the mom goes to the placenta and becomes progesterone, since such a trophoblast does that. The progesterone then goes to the fetal and, excuse me, goes to the fetal adrenals, uh, that turns it into androgens. All right, good to know. I think they're talking about this process right here. So then it goes over here. The son makes it. I guess I, the, the mother has the cholesterol, and then the the placenta takes that cholesterol, turns it into progesterone. Some of that progesterone goes to the mother and helps the mother's uterus not contract down. And some of some of the other um, progesterone goes to the fetus. The fetus takes that progesterone, turns it into androgens, and those androgens in turn go back to the placenta, and the placenta changes those androgens into estrogens, and those estrogens go to the mother and causes her breasts to enlarge and other changes to occur, more uh, things that will allow the baby to uh, survive. Uh, this is a good picture. Um, oops. Yeah, actually, I did want to do that, sorry. Um, um, all right, so, oh my, there, oh, okay, um, okay, so, uh, okay, the mother, so, all right, the ovarian corpus luteum produces progesterone, 17 hydroxyprogesterone in early pregnancy, We've already mentioned that before, um, so there must be, uh, some particular kind of progesterone, production of progesterone then shifts to the placenta. Maternal hypothalamus and posterior pituitary produce and release oxytocin. Uh, anterior pituitary produces prolactin. So we were talking earlier about those things that come out of the anterior pituitary, and one of them is prolactin. Prolactin um, causes the um, the breast structures to to increase and to grow, um, so that. Um, 
the mother's breast will enlarge and she will be ready to breastfeed. Um, and it's oxytocin that causes the contents of the breast to um, be released as it tightens down the smooth muscle. Okay, so hormones of pregnancy that you should know. HCG, human uh, placental lactogen, corticotropin releasing hormone, progesterone. Why do I feel like, oh, we did already talk about this. Whew, boy, I'm really sorry. Uh, let me go where I was. Okay. I think we're on estrogens. Lost my place there. Apologize. Uh, all right, so estrogen, source, placenta. I think we already talked about all this. Yeah, we did. Androgens then get converted to estradiol and the placenta. Um, function, estradiol um, maintains the estrogen of pregnancy. It increases uterine blood flow and prepares breast for lactation. So estradiol um, or estriol, there you go. Um, estriol maintains the, uh, yeah, the, this, there's, remember there's three types of estrogen. There's the estrone, the estradiol, and the estriol. Estradiol is the one that's very specific to pregnancy. It doesn't really, it doesn't really hang, not really present at all uh, prior to pregnancy. Um, but after pregnancy, it, it's responsible for a lot of the changes that occur in the mother's body uh, that allow her to um, carry a healthy baby. So, um, special note, placenta lacks, yeah, we already know that. It's a repeat there. So androgens, uh, fetal adrenal cortex is where these come from. So this comes from the baby's um, adrenals. DHEA gets converted to testosterone and then estrogen. Good to know. Um, testosterone gets converted to DHT, dihydroxy, dihydroxy testosterone, and DHT makes male external genitalia. Uh, good to know. So there's testosterone and then there's something called dihydroxy testosterone. And it's basically like a more potent form of testosterone. Um, it's changed by, I believe, an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. And uh, it allows the, um, it's what, during, while well, the baby's developing, if you don't have that 5-alpha uh, uh, reductase, whatever, I, I hope that's the right name of it, the enzyme, I'm pulling this off the top of my head. Um, if you don't have that, then the baby will not develop normal uh, external genitalia um, and then uh, during puberty the baby will then uh, the, the child will then develop some and then at that point the, the penis will begin to develop um, so the uh, later on in life though men can develop too much of this and it's what causes the prostate to enlarge and it also can cause your hair to fall out. And so they give men uh, something called finasteride, or it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which prevents testosterone from turning into DHT, or dihydroxy testosterone. And uh, that allows men to keep their hair, and also allows their prostate not to get too big. But one of the adverse side effects that people report is that it also decreases their sex drive because dihydroxy testosterone is like super testosterone. And it also, uh, people report that it can cause gynecomastia, which uh, means that you are a man and you grow breasts. And um, people don't like that. But apparently that doesn't happen very often. I've heard doctors say it, it practically never happens. But whatever. It discourages people from trying it. Uh, cortisol. So, the source of cortisol comes from the circulating cholesterol. Um, functions major role in activation uh, of labor by increasing placental release of corticotropin releasing hormone and prostaglandins. So, uh, basically, you need to make sure you don't stress out the mother or else you're going to put the mother in labor. So, um, um, uh, all the, this is all a careful balance here. I'm not going to go into detail as to what's occurring here, but hopefully you can look at that and, and piece it together yourself. Uh, we already covered oxytocin, relaxin, 
Um, so the mother has all these, um, all of these um, dense fibrous ligaments and things in her pelvis that are holding everything together. And uh, basically, in their normal state, they make it impossible for a baby ever to come out. Well, this thing called relaxin is released from the corpus luteum and the placenta, and it goes down to these dense fibrous connections, and it relaxes them so that when the time comes, the baby's head will be able to fit out of the small opening and um, won't get stuck. So relaxin is an important thing. It promotes implantation, apparently also, and uterine relaxation. Okay, good. Um, hopefully I wasn't off on the other thing I was talking about because I didn't mention it, but so my understanding of what it is. Apologize if I made a mistake. Prostaglandins. Placental production from arachidonic acid. Uh, so it looks like the placenta makes it, it takes the arachidonic acid and turns it into prostaglandins. And this is part of what initiates labor. So I remember uh, prostaglandin E2 is really important in labor and um, uh, might be something that might be on the boards for you. Um, endomethacin can inhibit prostaglandin synthesis. So endomethacin is one of the um, um, prostaglandin inhibitors. So you can take that and that will, that will stop making that, which would probably stop labor. Um, so what hormones induce actual labor? So there's three phases here, or I guess four phases if you include phase zero. So there's quiescence, activation, stimulation, and involution. And uh, talk about these. Phase zero is known as quiescence. So there's no labor or the part leading up to labor. So it's not even starting to start. Progesterone maintains the pregnancy and prevents contractions. Progesterone is kind of what prevents the mother from actively pushing that baby out. Eventually, you know, that progesterone starts to decrease. Um, phase one activation, uterine stretch signals. So the baby gets so big, it's pushing down on the, uh, bo the bottom of the uterus there, the opening, and, um, and that is going to cause this activation of the myometrium, or the smooth muscle and it stretches out those gap junctions and they start to contract and this happens for quite a while they call this false labor like 48 weeks or something kind of stretching its muscles um, to get ready to push that baby out so then the fetal hypothalamic uh, fetal hypothalamic contraction excuse me fetal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access uh, to the uh, corticotropin releasing hormone in fetal hypothalamus causes the release of adrenocorticotropic hormone, which increases cortisol and androgen production in the fetus, which causes increased contractions. So it looks like you have too much uh, corticotropin hormone or adrenocorticotropin hormone or whatever. Uh, those are like our stress hormones. And uh, if it looks like you've released too many of those, um, it's going to cause contraction to, to occur. So. That's why they don't want women to be stressed out if she has a really horrible, stressful event. It can actually induce labor. Um, phase two now. So we went from quiescence, now we're activated. We've got, with activation, we've got uh, the stretch occurring with those uh, smooth muscle cells. We also got uh, corticotropin releasing hormone causing adrenocorticotropin hormone to be released. Now in stimulation, phase two, uh, this probably begins with the placental production of corticotropin releasing hormone, which is stimulated by glucocorticoids. So prostaglandins induce cervical ripening. That's what they call it when the cervix starts to thin out uh, and increase uterine contractility. So this is where you're really getting close. Um, last part of pregnancy, the baby's uh, head is getting closer, the cervix is ripening. And then phase three is involution. This is the expulsion of the fetus, which is done by oxytocin. If you remember, oxytocin was that thing that actually causes the smooth muscle to clamp down. It happens in the uterus, but also happens in the breast. And the cell bodies in the hypothalamus release um, down their axons, which are contained in the posterior pituitary, release this um, um, oxytocin, which um, will cause the milk to come out and the baby to come out. All right, so next we're talking about the cardiovascular changes in pregnancy. 
So arterial uh, blood pressures decrease and hit their lowest point at 20 to 24 weeks. Diastolic blood pressure falls more drastically than systolic. The supine position um, accentuates venous compression of the inferior vena cava. I should probably talk about this a little bit more. Okay, let me, let me talk. So arterial blood. Uh, so when the mother becomes pregnant, hormones, uh, one of the first things that's going to happen is, is her, her venous system increases in its capacity. In other words, the smooth muscle in, in the veins um, uh, are become relaxed, and so it's almost like the full container of her blood is larger. And when the container of the blood is larger, um, but you don't increase the amount of fluid in the container, that's going to cause a decrease in blood pressure, because it's like you've got a tiny bit of blood in this huge container. Um, that that um, ratio is is its furthest apart, in other words, the least amount of blood versus the largest amount of relaxation at 20 to 24 weeks. Well, following that, the mother's body starts um, releasing more of those uh, signals that cause, it, cause her to retain fluid. And her blood pressure, because she starts retaining lots of fluid, is going to start increasing and her blood pressure will eventually become about normal towards the very end. By the end, she's, she's at a normal blood pressure. It fills, her, her body fills up that empty container. So the diastolic pressure is going to fall um, uh, originally quite a bit. Why, you know, that's the, there's diastolic and systolic, and I believe the diastolic uh, relates more to the venous and... Um, and systolic more to the arterial. Although well, somebody might laugh at me if they heard me say that, that's not in, not correct. Uh, supine position. So that means laying on your back. Um, prone would be laying on your stomach. So a supine position is actually going to accentuate the venous compression of the inferior vena cava. Think about it. Baby's pressing down on the inferior vena cava, which is located near the spine. So that's going to make that uh, that venous compression is going to accentuate. Uh, this uh, blood change in the mother, producing a fall in venous return and a decrease in cardiac output. It's getting less, you get less blood coming back to the heart, uh, then you're going to get less blood to the heart, you know, because the inferior vena cava is being crushed. And if you get less blood to the heart, the blood's going to have less, the heart's going to have less blood to push out from the heart, so therefore your cardiac output decreases. Um, and, um, so that's why women need to lay on their left side, and that avoids the inferior vena cava from being crushed, which allows her to have a norm, more normal cardiac output. The, the mother's cardiac output does increase um, during pregnancy, um, eventually, because she remember she has more fluid in her, and with more fluid, that's going to allow more fluid to get to the heart, which is going to increase cardiac output. Uh, theory of physiology revolves around elevations of aldosterone, vasodilators like prostaglandins. Atrial natriuretic peptide, nitric oxide, reduce arterial tone and increase venous captance. So what they're saying here, aldosterone causes you to retain uh, salt and also retain water with it. Um, it's part of the um, angiotensin uh, aldosterone axis, um, and so they think this is what's going to cause the mother to hold on to the water. A vasodilator, like a prostaglandin, is that what they think is going to cause the blood vessels or venous system to enlarge. And uh, atrial natriuretic peptide and nitrous oxide, these are also more things to do that kind of stuff. Um, it's like you can give people nitrous oxide to, if they're having a heart attack, to kind of relax things so they can get more blood to their heart. Um, heart rate increases by 12 to 18 beats per minute throughout all trimesters. Um, so mother's heart's going to be a little faster. It'll increase cardiac output. Uh, stroke volume is going to increase, which also increase cardiac output. Well, this doesn't always increase cardiac output. Faster doesn't always mean you get more blood out. But the stroke volume is increasing too. So that will increase cardi uh, cardiac output. And therefore the, cardi the cardiac output um, is... Uh, The cardiac output is going to increase 33 to 45 percent. That's that's a pretty big increase, and uh, 
the uh, blood plasma increases more than the red blood cell volume. Uh, let me explain what that means. So, in what we just we just call it blood, okay? <laughs> um, there's red blood cells, there's white blood cells, there's albumin, there's all these things, there's fluid, and, um, and the question here is, uh, you know, there's this this base ratio. I believe it's it's almost like um, uh, I'm not going to tell you. I think it's like 45 and 55 percent, um, you know, between the, these different main components. But anyway, the the what they're saying here is that the fluid comp component is increasing more than the red blood cell component. Okay, if the red blood cell component increases more than the fluid component, then the the fluid the the, the blood would be more viscous, thick, maybe more like molasses, okay? Um, but that's not the case here, it's the other way around, so that means the mother's blood is going to be more thin, can travel around places more quickly, isn't going to get stuck places as easily, because um, there's not more red blood cell volume. Uh, the red blood cell uh, is decreased, but overall, there's more blood, more, you know, fluid in her. Um, hopefully I explained that in a way that makes sense. All right, respiratory changes in pregnancy. Um, respiratory rate stays the same, but tidal volume is going to uh, progressively increase during pregnancy. So the tidal volume is like in normal breath. <sighs> now I'm kind of exaggerating there so you can hear me over the speaker, but it's like the normal amount that you breathe in and breathe out. So the mother's gonna breathe a little bit deeper normally. Okay, so the tidal volume is going to increase. Increases by about 0.1 to 0.2 liters. So the total volume is equal to the air breathed in and breathed out uh, with normal, sorry, tidal volume. Is, is the air breathed out with normal um, breathing. Okay, so just normal breathing is going to increase a little bit because the tidal volume, volume increases. So the expiratory reserve volume, that's the amount of um, air in the lungs left over when you breathe out uh, a breath is lowered and the reason why that's lowered is because the baby is growing which pushes on the uterus and the uterus then pushes on the diaphragm and the diaphragm pushes on the lungs and so everything kind of gets pushed up and that's going to that's going to decrease the total lung capacity uh, but especially the expiratory reserve volume amount of air that's left over when you breathe out so that lowers about 15 percent um, the maximum volume of air that can be additionally expired forcefully after normal breath. Yeah, so that's the definition of that. And the residual volume. This falls considerably uh, late in pregnancy. And the reserve volume is volume of air remaining in the lungs after maximum expiration. Okay, so when you completely breathe out all of the air that you can, the, 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 the air that's left in there still, because you can't ever get it all out. I mean, you don't want your lungs to collapse. That amount is the residual volume. That, that, that decreases quite a bit. And that's, again, because of the baby growing, pushing up on it. Vital capacity is going to stay the same. Uh, vital capacity is like the total amount of air that you can breathe in and the total amount of air that you can breathe out. If I remember correctly, so maximum volume of air that can be forcefully inspired. Yeah, okay. Um, inspiratory capacity is going to increase by about 5%. So, inspiratory capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be inspired from a resting, resting expiratory level. Um, I'm spending a little too much time on this. Functional residual capacity lowered by about 18%. Functional residual capacity is the volume of air um, in the lungs at resting expiratory level. This is caused by pressure from the fetus and diaphragm. We explained this already. Uh, minute ventilation, this is going to increase. Remember, she's breathing more quickly. Or, she, right, no, sorry, she's not breathing more quickly. She's breathing the same, according to this. Well, it seems like I read somewhere else that she actually breathes more quickly, but... Um, oops. So it looks like her rate's the same, but her tidal volume has increased. So now she's breathing a little bit more deeply, normally. Um, so it looks like the, the minute ventilation increases by about 40 percent as the as a result of the increased tidal volume and unchanged respiratory rate. The volume of air inspired or expired in one minute. So.
that's going to increase. She's actually breathing a lot more air. And that makes sense because she needs more air because she needs to give the baby some of the air that she's breathing. And uh, that does occur. Um, total body oxygen consumption increases by about 15 to 20 percent. I don't know. Okay. What is it that causes her to breathe a little more deeply? Increase her tidal volume? That's progesterone. Okay. Progesterone increases ventilation and makes CO2 central chemoreceptors to be more sensitive. Um, so in your brain, you have these things called uh, car carbon mark, or, excuse me, chemoreceptors, and uh, and this is going to increase those. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there. We'll pick up in a minute.